The Office is one of those shows that, for many around the world, is played on repeat on whatever streaming platforms available in that household. The show's become a phenomenon and it's arguably watched more now than when it was during its initial run on NBC. One of the main criticisms of The Office, though, is the increasingly seeming craziness of the characters in the series. In other words, how does the series move from a show about a cringe-inducing boss to this? Say bandit! Or this. Hyperana, butoxide, as well as... <gasps> Dwight, are you okay? And so on. And hey everybody, I'm Chris. I'm reviewing every episode of The Office on my channel, but today we are looking at some theories on why The Office becomes significantly more slapsticky and erratic through its nine seasons. Erratic? I can't take credit for all of these ideas. Some are from specific Reddit posts and they'll be credited, and some are just general ideas produced from the collective hive mind that is The Office fandom. Okay, so let's start off with a really simple one, the show within a show theory. This one has many forms, sometimes being taken in the form of a reality show, like I talked about in my last Office Theory video. Sometimes it has Jim and Pam as the head writers of their own sitcom. Whatever angle the theory takes, the idea is that there is a meta layer between the in-show universe and our reality in which a different show exists. In other words, it's a show within a show inside of a show. Support for this theory comes from the simple idea of why would PBS film at Dunder Mifflin Scranton for nine years? I mean, that's a really expensive and extensive project. But on top of that, as many deep thinking fans have pointed out, the show sits right in the middle of a tough time in the US economy and the paper industry alike. Yet the Scranton branch barely loses a single employee and on top of that, the branch is always thriving. So how does that explain the increasingly erratic behavior? Well, to keep the viewership up, shows often have to up the ante. It's true. This is how you have severe character changes like the difference between Michael in season one and the rest of the series. You'll also notice that most of the side characters begin to lose their depth and become one dimensional as the series closes out. Theoretically, all of this could be explained by the writing crew behind all of the shenanigans of the characters of The Office, which there is, but a different one. Anyway, moving on, radon poisoning. Toby knows it, everyone's slowly going crazy. We should really have the office's air quality tested. I mean, we have radon coming from below, we have asbestos in the ceilings. These are silent killers. You are the silent killer. Go back to the annex. Many fans point to Toby as the Scranton Strangler, and while that is definitely not true, Toby seemed to be onto some serious environmental concerns within the office. And lastly, I'd love to urge you to keep up with my fight to have the building checked for radon gas. Was there really a radon problem in the office? I guess we're never gonna know, but Toby seemed to think so. This here is a radon test kit. Okay, I'll be putting them everywhere. And please don't throw these out. This is a radon test kit. What are the side effects of radon poisoning? Well, they range from minor symptoms like the shortness of breath to severe, like brain cancer. This theory posits that the increasingly erratic and bizarre behavior of those in the office evolves solely due to the sneaky killer radon. It might be also why Michael and Andy are both somewhat normal in the finale, as they spend some time away from the office. Also, the reverse of that is true for Erin. She kind of is this petri dish for this experiment. She starts as this meek and quiet secretary and eventually becomes this. Okay. Okay. This might also explain why Daryl, a character who was pretty normal when he worked in the warehouse, became this. <laughs> Go get him. Oh! <laughs> So this theory might have some credibility. Maybe it's why the dock crew stayed in the branch for so long. The director had some clouded judgment. Maybe Toby's lack of perseverance doomed them all. You'll see. Number three, Andy suffering from alcohorse. Okay, stick with me on this one. This theory comes from this awesome Reddit post. And similar to the radon theory, the alcohorse theory attempts to explain how Andy Bernard, an Ivy League college graduate and overall seemingly competent dude who wears sweaters and stuff, becomes someone who would abandon his life for months to go on a boat trip with Josh Groban. Them's my cords! And then eventually quit his job to pursue a career in singing. This theory acknowledges that Andy is always slightly crazy, but his behavior takes a turn at this moment. The five Chinese virility herbs. No kidding. This is powdered seahorse. As Ryan explains, powdered seahorse gives men super strength. 
but Andy definitely overdosed on it while consuming alcohol, which is universally a bad call when taking any substance that you're not certain the alcohol will interact neutrally with. And this idea is reinforced by this bit. What does this say? Hi, Ma. Buyao. Ganjo. Luangao. Here's that again, but with the loose translation. Hi, Ma. Buyao. Ganjo. Luangao. So this theory attributes Andy's subsequent behavior to brain damage caused by alcohols, and there's a lot of behavior to explain. Yaruba, yaruba. Aruba, yaruba. Yaruba, yaruba. This theory only explains Andy's behavior, but perhaps the increasingly erratic behavior seen in the other characters of The Office is merely a manifestation of Andy's deranged mind. Moving on. All right, like the first one, this theory takes several forms, and it's that they're all dead. This one is similar, or a branch, from my broader Sherverse theory, but it hinges on the idea that characters are either dead already, or a character dies during the series, and the rest of what we see is the equivalent to a Jacob's Ladder-esque fever dream in the character's mind as they're passing away. There's no shortage of near-death experiences in this show either. Meredith, very blessed. <laughs> Stanley. Oh, come on, it's not real, oh Stanley. Don't Stanley. have a heart attack. Oh, no, 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 no. You will not die. Stanley, Stanley, you will not die. Michael and Dwight. It's the the machine knows. This is the light. Stop yelling at me. No, it's Stop not yelling. yelling. There's no light here. Stanley again. That in your haunches, it's like you're catching a medicine. The size of my haunches. And I've always been particularly interested in Andy's experience in the sumo suit. I mean, how did he ever get out of that? We never see it. Do sumo suits even float? Maybe he didn't float. He just simply sank to the bottom of Lake Scranton that day. Who's there? My name is Andrew Bernard. I was with a group called Thunder Mifflin. Hello? Very spooky. Like the rest of the near-death experiences, though, the increasingly erratic behavior in the show could be explained by the weird fever dreams of the soon-deceased. Or they were just dead the whole time. And check that one out. It is a good video. Spoiler alert. He was dead the whole just time. Just stop it. And all of these theories are a little dark, but it is fun to spot out these things in the series that we love. So that's my list. What do you think? Anything I missed? Maybe you have a theory of your own. Leave it in the comments. Why do we think the staff became so cuckoo bananas over the years? So if you're still here, consider checking out the rest of my channel. We're reviewing every episode of The Office. We dig in, we look at the good, the bad, the ugly, the deeper meaning, and a whole lot of other stuff. So check it out. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.